Hello, hello, hello. Are we up? Hey guys, it's Mike Myers with his Monday through Friday, Ask Me Anything. The goal of this live stream is to give those of us an opportunity who are working towards our CompTIA certifications, a venue, especially those of us who are isolated right now, you don't have anybody to study with, and maybe your classes are being held remotely. Uh, this is for you. Uh, so feel free to ask any kind of questions you want on the CompTIA IT Fundamentals A+, Network+, Security+. My sound is good. Thank you so much, guys, for telling me that. I, Batman David Rush, thank you very, very much. Uh, I think I'm getting a little bit better at this. Oh, wow, we got the entire group here. Um, what did you miss yesterday? Oh, I was giving away everybody $500. Now, so I guess you're all wondering, Mike, how's the diet going? Well, the diet's going great. Unfortunately, my nutritionist has now told me that I'm not drinking enough fluids. So now I'm sitting around with this thing. I'm trying to get more water in me. And unfortunately, the first couple days I've been doing this, all of a sudden all this great weight loss I've been doing kind of stopped because, well, I'm not being dehydrated all the time. So, yeah, so I'm going to be, we call this my noogie. <laughs> I don't have a name for it. 128 ounces a day, kids. You think you can do it? Yeah, I can do it. I can do it. All right. Oh, so Peter Hunt, you passed both the exams. Yeah, beer is a fluid. I love, I love beer, Batman. I love wine better, but, you know, I can drink a beer. Um, so, anyway, uh, welcome aboard, gang. Uh, really, it is Ask Me Anything. So we do have a couple of announcements. Number one, just because you're nice enough to be here today, you get this week we're offering 50% discount on the CompTIA A+, Net+, and Security+, practice questions from Total Seminars. So I'm going to count on my buddy Scott Jernigan. I did not bring up my team's account, so Scott cannot talk to me. Let's get that up so Scott Jernigan can say things to me. And hopefully he hasn't set up anything panic-stricken yet to say everything. He says, sound is fine. Okay, great. Sorry, Scott. I didn't even have Teams up, so I didn't even see you were talking to me. All right, so anyway, let's get a couple of screens here organized so I can actually talk to you guys on some kind of timely basis. Something just happened. Hope I'm still up. Yep, I think we're okay. Okay, so anyway, um, so just because you're here, you get 50% off of all of our, not all of, our A+, plus, Net+, plus, and Security+, plus, uh, practice questions. Guys, these are very, very good practice questions. You know, a lot of questions I get from people who are like, they're on lynda.com or Udemy or one of our other uh, partners out there, and they're like, hey, Mike, uh, so I've taken my Linda course, or I've taken my Udemy course, is that all I need? And the answer is yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the videos by themselves are self-standing. Self However, I do feel that it's always a good idea to get practice questions. Yeah, here I am trying to sell you more stuff. But uh, the reality is, is that practice questions just give you an opportunity to practice what you're about to do for real on the CompTIA exams. So, uh, I like my practice questions quite a bit. I'm very proud of my practice questions. But believe it or not, I also recommend you buy a competitor's practice questions. It's always a big challenge when you're dealing with this stuff is, uh, especially as someone like me who writes questions, and I'm always writing these questions. And, and I wanna kind of mimic the tone of a CompTIA question, but the reality is is that people who write questions, they get a voice in their practice questions, just like people have a voice writing a novel. And it can often be a very good thing for you to go and have like two different people's sets of questions and, you know, intermix them, do whatever you want to do. And it, it doesn't lock you into one tone, one voice of question that I've, I've seen that hurt people sometimes when they're going for an exam. And it's, it's, you can try as a writer of questions to avoid it, but it is shockingly hard to do especially when you're like, I've got to get 50 more questions written. You know, it's like, for me, if I can write 25 good questions a day, that is a record. Uh, Robin Abernathy over at uh, Transcender, which is a competitor of mine, good folks over at Transcender. If you weren't buying my questions, I'd rather you buy Transcenders. And uh, she can write a lot more questions than me per day. I, I, it's just hard. Come on, guys, think about it. Hard enough answering those questions, try writing them. 
Now it's like, I need to cover objective 3.2, you know, or whatever it is, and try to write good quality questions. You know, the other thing that people often don't realize is that I don't have access to the CompTIA questions. Nobody does, other than CompTIA. They're literally the only people. Uh, now, I have 25 years experience working with CompTIA. I have a sense of how CompTIA writes things. I think I do a pretty good job mimicking the look and feel and the tone of actual CompTIA questions, but I don't know what the questions are either. Isn't that crazy? And nobody does, nobody does. So, something interesting to consider. All right, well, first of all, uh, do we have any big, anybody? Sorry, I'm just checking questions real quick. Wayne's World, hey, Wayne's World, that's a new name. <clears throat> Did the cat go by? Yeah, that cat. I call the cat Spewy, 18 years old and about to go. Uh, TS, uh, let's take a look at those. I, I will, Andrew, I'll answer your question too then. Um, but uh, first of all, the big thing is we got a big announcement today, folks, and that is after a month of doing this Monday through Friday, uh, starting next Monday, we're going to go to Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. The reality is the situation is that Security Plus, the new Security Plus is uh, in route. I have to develop training materials. We've got to shoot videos for this stuff. Uh, we've got to get some work done. And uh, as much as I love you guys, and I do, and I really do enjoy doing this, by the way, um, we're going to, I'm going to need a little more time and uh, I'm tired of working every Saturday and Sunday and you know, so uh, to get a little more time, we're going to cut it back to a Monday, Wednesday and Friday. Now in, re in exchange for that, I'll, I'll, we'll spend more time on Monday, Wednesdays and Fridays. So basically, I will go up to two hours so you actually get more time with me per week if you want it. Uh, but the, the statement I need to make, make sure we're very clear is that I will go up to two hours. So basically, uh, if, if you're new to this format, I originally started this as just an ask me anything where people would ask questions and I would answer on the fly. Uh, what we discovered over uh, the weeks is that sometimes it was really, really hard for me to answer the question, uh, not because I didn't know the answer, <laughs> but more because I wanted to present the answer in a way that made more sense. And, uh, to that end, we started setting up days where we would just go, okay, we're going to talk about, uh, gosh, so many different topics we've talked about, subnetting or whatever it might be, and uh, it ended up kind of going that direction, which is fine, and something I'm glad to, and I will continue to do, but the questions try sometimes slow down a little bit. So here's the bottom line. We'll be doing this Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, got it, and it'll be up to two hours. So whatever we're talking about, if things get slow or things get quiet, then I'll just sign off right at that point. Um, and uh, we will then pick it up uh, the day at, the day, the day at, after skipping a day. And uh, so be aware of that, guys. So that's going to start this Monday, uh, same time uh, and longer hours as needed. Uh, but just we're going to be skipping Tuesdays and Thursdays so I can get some work done, mainly on Security Plus more than anything else. So I also need to warn you is that we have thunderstorms coming through Houston, Texas right now. And uh, if, if the power goes out, I'm not going to much I'd be able to do about it. So keep your fingers crossed uh, that the uh, thunder and lightning that's uh, going through here won't uh, knock us out. We have pretty good electricity here in Houston, but it does happen. The other problem is, is about two hours ago, I shattered a tooth. And it hurts. And I'm going to be going to a dentist after this presentation, but... Uh, Owie, it hurts a little bit, so if I make wincing noises, it's just because half of an incisor is uh, sitting there. So, but I'm okay, I'm okay. It's not the first time it's happened. Brush and floss, kids. Brush and floss. All right, so uh, let's see. How are we doing on questions here so far? We got uh, Andrew X. X, hey, I just bought the A-plus practice question. Thanks for the discount. Oh, yeah, no problem there. Glad to do that. Uh, Andrew Hutz, hey Mike, can you quickly explain the difference between an unattended installation for Windows and an image deployment? Uh, sure. I mean, it, it's uh, with an unattended installation, basically, you're still installing Windows on every system, but you have what's known as an unattended file, which kind of pre answers it, it pre answers all those questions that you would run through during an installation. 
So it kind of automates it. Most of the time when you do an unattended installation, that means it really, it really is attended, but it's usually attended by the end user or somebody like that. And you'll say, go ahead and start the system up, and it'll be a point where it's gonna ask you for a username or something like that, because it just pre-answers all those questions for you. An image deployment is where you have 400 of the exact same machines, and you have to do, if you want image deployment to work, the systems have to be very similar, if not downright identical. And that happens all the time in enterprises. We buy 200 new HP laptops or something like that. Or, you know, we buy 150 new Dell desktops. And with an image deployment, you basically plug all these systems into a network, uh, have them boot off of some type of file, and then an image is deployed to all those systems. Now, this image isn't just Windows. If you want to have applications pre-installed, uh, all kinds of stuff like that, pre-configured desktops, configurations like that, all that can be handled through an image deployment. So they're very different animals. Uh, so an image deployment, you basically have a bunch of the same system where you're shooting out a bunch of stuff, and then an unattended file is basically, you have a little text file that pre-answers all of the questions that you see during a Windows installation. And specifically, what situations are best to use them? I think I described it. So Andrew, if I got, uh, every time a new salesperson comes into the company, we give them a laptop. So what we do is, we uh, ship it out to them because salespeople don't have offices. We have them run the installation with the unattended file. They don't even know they're under, under installing Windows. They just think they're booting it up, and we warn them that it's going to take you know 15 minutes. So you know, take your time, and it gives them an opportunity to type in regional information, their username, their password, you know, that kind of stuff. A uh, image deployment is usually done when we have a whole bunch of systems that we want really pre-configured. Uh, usually image, image deployment includes applications and stuff like that, and then we just shoot those out to a gazillion systems at once. Oh, that's right, Transcender is now CyberVista.net, sorry about that. Paul Murphy, Mike, can I send you my newly reworked resume to look at? Yeah, I mean, I'm not a resume expert. I mean, I'll, I'll be glad to look at it for you. Uh, there you go, Paul. Oh, no, my contact information's gone? What the heck? Ah, for some reason, I made a point not to look at that. Fine, Scott Jernigan, will you do me a favor, brother, and uh, just put in my contact information? So, Paul Murphy, sure, I'll take a look at it. We'll have Scott Jernigan type in uh, my email address. Uh, I can type it in myself, but Scott types it in prettier and faster, and uh, we can uh, go that route. So yeah, I'll take a look at it. If you don't have it already, Paul, I don't know, just being sure. David Burns, howdy Mike, howdy David. Found a test center near me, it's open, so I'll end up taking the test in the facility, trying online again. You know, uh, th some people go with that, you know, and it's still kind of new, so uh, let me know how that all works out for you, David, I'm very curious. Uh, you'd be surprised, yeah, yeah, this cat's old. In fact, Scott Jernigan had a cat, Omar. That cat was, Scott, was that cat like 23 years old? He was old, man, old cat. Um, Omar, he was an outside cat, too. I'm just reading here. Uh, you guys are talking to each other. That's fine. I'm going to let you guys do that. Yeah, Tony, you got my Skills USA. You figured it out. Skills USA is my primary charity. Uh, I, I'm a big believer in what Skills USA does. TJ Thoss from Mid Florida. Hello. I have lots so many. Oh, Florida. Uh, Omar made it to 22. Thomas, you know what I'm feeling like with a sore tooth. I mean, luckily, it's not like in terrible, horrific pain. It just snapped. You know, don't get old, kids. What's the old adage? Die young, leave a good corpse. Um, oh, so David Burns. So the person you did refund you. Okay, that was good. And five days, the, in, in this day and age, to get a refund in five days, that sounds fantastic. I'm, I'm glad that worked out for you. I was worried about that. 
I don't know. Okay, so anyway, it looks like the questions have petered out a little bit. So what I want to do right now is uh, we were going to be talking about topologies, uh, networking topologies, and um, so we had a little technical difficulty, uh, yeah, but uh, we're all past that and everything's tested and ready to go. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, let's do a real quick thing on topologies, okay? Now topologies are basically, when, when we, to understand topologies, you gotta go way back, you know, more than 30 years ago, because today we just live in a world where everything's ethernet for the most part, at least in terms of LANs. Um, but if you go back, way back in the old days, you had technologies with names like Apple Talk and ArcNet and Token Ring and all this stuff. So topologies were really, really important during the early cabling days. It became less important because TCP IP, I'm sorry, because Ethernet owned everything, uh, but it's become important again, mainly because of wireless. So with that attitude in mind, let's start with probably the oldest of all topologies ever known, a bus topology. So with a bus topology, basically what you have is a bunch of systems all connected to a single cable. And this single cable is generally known as the segment. Now this cable could be running up through the ceiling and then there would be to each system they would have a drop that would cut, it would literally drop down from the ceiling and then connect into individual computers. In fact, sometimes you'll, to this day you hear the word drop, it came from these. Uh, but, so, but this is, these were very ancient technologies from the early 1980s with names like, uh, oh God, I don't even remember the names anymore. 10 base 5 and names like that. So, uh, so they were around for a long time. A ring topology, you basically have a cable, and the cable is not a perfect circle, okay? The cable's running around in the ceilings too, and there's drops going down to individual computers. The interesting thing about a ring topology is that you, you would have a thing called a token that would spin around on that circle, and if anybody wanted to talk, they had to grab the token. It was, uh, it was pretty cool. And there was something called token ring back in the old days. I don't remember who it was, but it was just a couple of weeks ago, I was on uh, doing an AMA, and I was like, yeah, old school bus ethernet is yesterday, just haters, nobody uses it anymore. Token ring is dead and gone. And this person is like, Mike, we use it every day. So yeah, there's always somebody using an old technology, but these types of topologies, bus and ring are extremely rare in today's world. There was also one called a star topology. Now star topology was kind of weird because what you had was a unpowered, basically a big ball of solder in the center that these things would connect to. Star topologies were very rare, very weird, and they didn't last very long. They, they didn't make it out of the 90s. Okay, so Thomas Robinson, you're talking about having like terminators on the end and all that. Uh, there, we still make the slightest mention of this on Network Plus, but the reality is, is we're not even sure topologies are covered anymore. What I'm doing right now is I'm directly responding to a request from one of the viewers, they, they had some questions on topology, so I definitely wanted to hit on that. What we're definitely not gonna be doing is talking about 802.5 or 802.2 and T connectors and terminators and all that junk. So the problem with bus and ring topologies is if the, there was a break anywhere the entire network went down. This was a real frustration and something they wanted to work out really hard to try to avoid. And they came up with a very clever idea. And what they did is they go, why don't we just take the entire segment, they did it with token ring too, but I'm, I'm interested in this stuff, because this is ethernet, and take the entire segment and just shrink it into a box. And these were known as hybrid topologies. This is a star bus. It's really a bus topology, but it connects as a star. If any one of these devices disconnects, it doesn't affect the segment and it doesn't take everybody down. 
So we're really talking about a hybrid topology. Now, when you talk about a hybrid topology, suddenly the idea of topology can mean two totally different things. So a, like this Starbus topology, number one, you're gonna have a physical topology, which is really how the cables physically look. You can, you can take a picture and see how the cables are. So a star bus looks like a star. However, you'll have what's known as a logical or what CompTIA likes to call a signaling topology. And that basically means how the signals travel electronically. So star bus is physically a star, but logically it's still a bus like the old versions of Ethernet from back in the day. I always get a little paranoid when I start doing a little talk like this and suddenly nobody's typing in any questions. Does that tell me that I'm boring you to death or am I that utterly fascinating that you grasp on every word that I say? Mike Myers, popular author, okay. Anyway, heading on back. So the more interesting topology these days that we're gonna be running into is Whoop, hang on. Oh, okay, topologies are still on something. Uh, I think he means, I think it's net plus. If I said topologies weren't on the net plus, I'm gonna backpedal right now because they are. And that's just been uh, clarified to me by Scott Jernigan. And that's why he makes the big books. Okay, so. In a mesh topology, every computer connects to every, com every other computer via two or more routes, okay? In a partially mesh topology, at least two of the machines will have redundant connections where they can come in through different routes. And in a fully mesh topology, every computer connects directly to every other computer. So let's look at this. So here I got two examples of five network computers, five computers in a network. Now, I want you to look first of all on the right where you see it says fully meshed. In that case, you can see that every computer is directly connected to every other computer. That's what fully meshed means. If every computer is directly connected to every other computer, no exception, it's fully meshed. That is an interesting concept that never happens in the real world. What's more common is what you see on the left, partially meshed. In this case, all of the computers have at least two routes, but like this computer right here only has a single connection. This is a far more common situation, particularly in wireless networks. Wireless networks uh, that take advantage of mesh topologies, uh, every individual, what do you call the in individual little boxes? Are they WAPs? I mean, you can connect to any of them. I'm gonna call it a mesh WAP until Scott Jernigan types in a more proper term. All the little boxes you plug around in your house. Um, these devices, pretty much, if they all see each other, you've already screwed up the beauty of what mesh is. Uh, for me, the mesh network is, allows an extension, a casual extension, because I can plug these in casually and they can pretty much catch on to somebody, and therefore, I don't have to think about it. And that's really, for a lazy man like me, the beauty of mesh is I can, these things just, they plug in like little night lights. You know, they even have a night light, which is kind of cool. And they plug them in, <laughs> hang on a minute. I gotta check something. Okay, good, you guys can't see it. <clears throat> the cat's being disgusting behind the scenes, and I'm watching her. Yeah, way to go, cat. It's called a kitty litter box. I'm gonna put target symbols around it. <sighs> anyway, so that, that's the beauty. So pretty much all wireless mesh networks are all going to be partially meshed. All right, let's get back to it. All right, now for the exam, make sure you're comfortable with this formula. And this is what tells us the number of connections that are necessary uh, for a fully mesh network. So let, let's try this out. So let's say I got three computers, you got it? All right, so n is now equal to three. So let's do the math. So three times three minus one is two. So three times two is six. Six divided by two is three. And if you look at this, 
it makes pretty obvious sense that we have three connectors to make a fully mesh network with three nodes. Okay, so let's do it again. Let's, let's, try, let's do it this time with four nodes. So n is now equal to four. Let's do the math. Uh, four times four minus one, which is three. Four times three is 12. 12 divided by two is six. And if you go through here, don't do it, three, four, five, six. CompTIA likes to know that you know the number of connections necessary given n number of nodes for a mesh network. Uh, ba -da -ba. I'm trying to get around these conversations here. Okay. Dave Rush is retracting things left and right. You guys called them WAPs or satellites? I'll, I don't care. Those things, you know? Do I mean a signal extender? No. What I'm talking about is that a mesh network, like my Eero, I, sh I wish I had a picture of it. I didn't think I'd be talking about this. I can almost yank the mic and go grab one. It's 226. Nah, I'm not going to do it. I'm, it. I could end up taking somebody down here. Uh, but they're just the little boxes of plug-ins. So you've got some base unit for my mesh network, and this base unit plugs directly into my router. And then I then plug these things all through my house. And I, it comes with a base unit plus, uh, this is the Eero, E-E-R-O brand that I use. It comes with a base unit plus two satellites. They were called satellites. Man, that's right. Thanks, Greg Davis. I, I remember that now. Satellites. And then, uh, but you can plug in more and you actually configure all of them just through your smartphone. It's a pretty convenient little toy. But it is not, it's, it's not a, a signal extender C Plasman 2009. To me, that often is a much more older tool. We, we often hear the term wireless bridge. I'm wondering if that might be the thing, or it could just be semantics and we're talking about different stuff. So either way, uh, I believe that's almost all we have for the presentation. The only other thing I want to talk about is a point-to-point -point connection. In a point-to-point -point connection, you have highly directional antennas that are pointed at each other. Now, I'm using wireless here. Point-to-point -point most certainly exists in a wired environment as well, but usually we're talking about two devices, usually physical devices, which are connecting directly to each other, and that is the only conversation they have. The last one is point-to-multipoint. In a point-to-multipoint uh, topology, you have some, it's usually, it, it's almost always thought in terms of, of towers, and uh, And, and it just uh, transmits to the individual systems in that type of situation. So the questions you'll run into, in fact, we're still haggling here whether it's even on the exams or not anymore. Uh, mesh will certainly be on there. Uh, but you know, making sure you know that formula is going to be 90% of the battle right there. So it's not a lot of questions, honestly. Not like it used to be. Okay. Uh, let's see what people are saying to me now. Okay, let's check for questions. Hey guys, if we got a slow day today, slow days happen. It's allowed to happen. It's not a big deal. Uh, but uh, mm, 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 mm. Mm, 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 mm. T.S. Mike, I just upgraded to AT&T Fiber. Good man. Put it behind my home Asus. You put it behind your home router? You bought an RTAC88U, but it bottlenecks? I'm using Cat6 patch cables. I'm not sure that, uh, I'm not sure your patch cables are going to be an issue. So what's, what I'm confusing is, TS, is you're using the term uh, behind. You upgraded to AT&T Fiber and you put it in front of your home router, but it bottlenecks. Are you saying that the fiber is bottlenecking or is the route, you don't know it's bottlenecking, the network's bottlenecking. And uh, let me think about this for a second. 
Oh, look at that. We got Michael Smyer all over this. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at this. Cut through forwarding is enabled. So I'm assuming here what you have is you have AT&T fiber coming in. You got an AT&T fiber box. Okay. So that guy's passing out something. Uh, you can make that AT&T box pretty dumb. You can turn a lot of stuff off there. Uh, plus the AT&Ts, the ones that I have at here at home, really get crabby uh, if they see another router uh, after them and they try to get around it. There were some settings in there. I actually ended up having to go to the AT&T help site and there was a, it was a user's forum and they had some settings and it may be something like what Michael Smyers talking about there being uh, cut through forwarding is enabled. So hopefully that can be helpful to you. Okay. Wow. All right. So guys, uh, da, ba, da, ba. looks like uh, we could be towards the end of the day already. Hey, we have a couple of early days. There's nothing wrong with that. Staying hydrated. All right. So uh, it, it, I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and uh, wrap this up for the day. Now, guys, do keep in mind if you have questions for me, uh, just go ahead and send them to my email. I'm going to have Scott Jernigan type my email in real quick. And uh, I mean, you're always glad to ask questions here, but I know a lot of times people have maybe the question isn't well formed in their minds or maybe they're feeling some challenges about asking questions on a forum here. Maybe their question is going to be dumb, which they're not. Um, I have a wonderful story about that. Um, so a billion years ago when they came up with nuclear power, like back in the 1940s, there was this Navy captain and his name was Hyman Rickover. And Hyman Rickover sat there and said, you know what one thing that nuclear reactions, I'm not talking about nuclear explosions here, folks, I'm talking about sustained nuclear reactions. Uh, in a sustained nuclear reaction, what, uh, what, what's the primary byproduct? The answer is heat, lots of heat, like outrageous amounts of heat. And Hyman Rickover sat there and goes, you know, I could use a nuclear fission, sustained nuclear fission, to generate heat, to boil water, to make steam, to push propellers. Because there's one thing that nuclear fission doesn't need that just about everything else needs, and that's oxygen, which is no big deal when you're on a destroyer sitting on the top of the ocean, but when you're at 300 feet down, getting air can be a little bit tough for a diesel engine. So Hyman Rickover, decided to start going to these seminars to learn about nuclear fission. And uh, you ever been in these kind of seminars and there's always that one person who tends to sit in the front of the classroom and they ask all the stupid questions to the point where literally the classroom starts going, ah, you know that kind of person? Well, that was Hyman Rickover. And these are people who are giving these, uh, th these, these lectures are like, Robert Oppenheimer, you know, and Seahorn and all the big famous physicists from the 30s and now into the 40s. And the, uh, in that one particular seminar, the teacher goes, look, Mr. Rickover, you're obviously an idiot. So what I'm gonna do is at the end of class, I'm going to give you a little bit special help so that you can catch up with everybody else. And Captain Rickover, who, by the way, ended his uh, career as an admiral, um, said, thank you very much. I, I, I would like that extra help. And at the end of the day, at, when the seminar ends, Hyman Rickover still sitting there. The instructor is there, as well as the rest of the class. The moral to this story is, is that for every hero who's courageous enough to raise his hands and ask a question, there are six sniveling cowards behind you going, thank God he asked that question. So there's no such thing as a stupid question in my universe. Uh, it happens sometimes, maybe you get teased a little bit, but there's no such thing as a stupid question. So never have any fear on that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, Wayne's World, any hints on functions at each OSA, OSI layer? Okay, so here we go. Yeah, Wayne, I can make this pretty easy. Most of your OSI stuff's gonna be happening. The questions you're gonna run into are gonna be on the first three layers. So the lowest layer, the physical layer, think ones and zeros. What does it take 
to get the ones and zeros there. What type of cabling, what type of radio frequencies, what type of fiber optics, whatever it might be. Your physical layer stuff is gonna be, has to do with the cables and stuff like that. Layer two, the question's almost invariably gonna say MAC address. Remember our 48-bit or 64-bit MAC addresses? Um, though, when you see that type of stuff, think MAC addresses for layer two. Layer three, think IP addresses, because that's where IP addresses live. So physical layer is gonna be types of cabling, CAT 6A. It's gonna be type of frequencies, 2.45 gigahertz band. Layer two is gonna be MAC addresses, ARP commands, that kind of stuff. Um, layer three is going to be um, proper subnet mass, making sure that you have uh, matching network IDs for two computers in the same network. You know, it can be notorious, you know, Bob's computer is 192.169.5.4 and Janice's computer is 192.168.5.44. He can't ping Janet, what's wrong? Because they're not on the same network ID. You know? So that kind of stuff, you need to watch out for uh, little stuff like that. But the rest of them really, honestly, I don't think you're gonna ever get a question on the transport layer. I can't say, I mean, you should know it. Um, uh, we, I guess you do run into some application layer stuff, particularly when we're talking about multi-function multi boxes that can do all kinds of stuff, like uh, application filtering and things like that. Uh, you might get some questions like that where that would be running on layer seven, but that'll get you. How's that? Hey Debbie, you finally showed up, man. You missed all the fun. Um, Is there a limit to how many computers can use a mesh network? No, not in terms of a topology level. In terms of topology, you simply define that stuff. Are there limits? I guarantee you every technology has some form of maximum number, but that's not a standard that I'm aware of. So I don't think there's anything absolutely critical like that. Explain MAC address filtering and how to delay access to a network. Okay, Allison, I can do that. So, uh, let's use this from a wireless standpoint because that's usually where you hear this term. Uh, man, I, I don't know if, I can't do it quickly on my setup. Well, maybe I, you know what? Let's, let's see if I can pull this off. I don't even know if uh, the router, this is the router that I've had sitting for the last few days back here, I have uh, finally got it plugged in. I am going to try to jump on this router real quick. And I'm going to see what it has in terms of security. IP and MAC binding is the term it uses here. Bear with me, guys. I'm, I'm gonna. I'm, I'm going cold here. Uh, this is not exactly what I was hoping for. I'm not saying it's good or bad. Okay, I can still do this. Unfortunately, I'm just not going to be able to do it with uh, pretty uh, extra tools, although this is kind of fascinating. Um, so uh, a MAC address is the 48-bit address that's built into every device, every wireless device, every Ethernet card in existence has built into it from the factory a 48-bit address. That address is manifested as 12 hexadecimal characters separated by seven dash. 12 hexadecimal characters in groups of two, so that makes six pairs separated by five dashes. There we go, okay. And uh, it is a unique identifier, hardware identifier to every particular device. So if I have, and, and that, uh, that MAC address is in every conversation, pretty much one way or another. Keep in mind that even when you're talking on IP addresses and stuff like that, that outside 
of that IP packet is going to be an Ethernet frame or an 802.11 frame that contains MAC information. In fact, we when I showed you like an 802.11 uh, packet, was that this week or maybe last week? We actually saw we saw those, which is kind of cool. Um, anyway, the bottom line is is that I can tell the wireless access point. I go look, only let in this MAC address, that MAC address, and the other MAC address. So if anybody else tries to connect, well, they're not going to be able to connect. Maybe they may not be able to connect to a particular SSID. We could have another SSID called guest, and on the guest SSID, we would not turn on MAC filtering. Uh, so that, that might be a thing. You, you can often do it either way. You can whitelist or blacklist on a MAC filtering. So you can say, we'll let anybody in except you know, Mike in his stupid Galaxy Fold that he shows off all the time. So, and and it actually works out pretty cool because what these will do is they'll see who's connected. You And almost any home router does this these days, or sorry, wireless access point. It'll show you who's logged in. And you can sit there and go, ah, oh, man, there's that evil Scott Jernigan. I hate him. I can actually turn him off and block his... Uh, MAC address and let everybody else in. So it could go either way. You can set it up to only let certain people in, or you can set it up to only keep certain uh, to keep certain people out. That's my answer. So actually, how this works is different on every router. I mean, one of the stories I tell people is like, okay, in a classroom, I'll tell this story. Because they're like, well, how does it work? And I'm like, I don't know. So I own a Mercedes 280 SLK, nice car. So do you think, and I'm going to pick on you, Allison, because, well, I like you better than anybody else. So Allison, do you think that you could get into my Mercedes Benz 280 SLK and work the windshield wipers? Your answer would be eventually, yeah, you could, you know, might have to poke around a little bit, but you can figure it out. And then I tease you a little bit and go, well, Allison, are, are you Mercedes Benz 280 SLK certified? You know, why, why are you so pompous as to say that you could sit down in my Mercedes Benz 280 SLK and run the windshield wipers? And then I pray that you don't say, well, I own a Mercedes Benz 280 SLK. Anyway, but, but the answer is, is, well, I mean, I have a basic understanding of windshield wipers work. And when I walk into a new car, I, I expect there to be windshield wipers. And if you let me sit down and hand me the keys, give me a couple minutes, I can get the windshield wipers working, get the intermittents running. Heck, I'd probably squirt fluid on your windshield and clean your windshield too. And I can do this all without any of your help. And the answer is why is because you understand the concept of windshield wipers, and what they're supposed to do. You haven't, can you guys hear that? There's an expectation of uh, having windshield wipers and you sit down and figure it out. And that's what we do with uh, uh, MAC address filtering on wireless networks. We know it's probably there. We poke around a little bit and we figure it out and then we decide whether we want to use it or not. For the record, I find uh, MAC address filtering to be uh, useless primarily because it's a pain in the rear end. Uh, how many people have wireless networks where you can actually lock down only certain people to use it? Um, that can be tricky. You know, some of you throw a party and all of a sudden everybody walks in with their phones and of course, everybody asks the same question. Hey, which, what SSID is yours and what's the password? So I guess if you want to go through the process of setting up a secondary SSID guest and, you know, do all that stuff, you know, do its own set of routing, you know, you could do that. But the reality is it's paying the rear end. CompTIA thinks it's an absolutely amazing thing to do. And for the exams, make sure you understand what MAC address filtering is but I don't think it's a really good thing, in my own opinion. Sam, I am. I got my A+, plus, Net+, plus, Security+, plus, Pen Test. Now you're OSCP. Thank you, Mike. You're welcome, Sam, I am. I hope I helped you with something. Yeah, C++ Man 2009, you missed a great lecture on... It was fun. We had fun. Allison Ledoux, how to create registry and do a backup. So you're talking about a Windows registry? Uh, you don't create a registry. The registry is created for you. Um, Windows makes lots of backups of your registry automatically. 
Uh, I'm pretty sure every time you do a snapshot, a backup, a registry backup's created. It has a original registry that uh, when this when Windows first boots up, that's set aside. There's another a third backup, and all of these backups you never touch. You just do a, run a Windows repair, use the uh, repair environment, you know, repair my computer, and Windows finds them for you auto magically. If you actually wanted to run a backup, you could do that. And you would use the tool called RegEdit. And what is, RegEdit doesn't call it backup. It's called, I'm actually pulling it up. It's not a backup. It's an export. So what you do is you, you pick whatever part of a registry. Usually what's happening in this type of situation, Allison, is you've been reading, you've got some kind of problem, and it's like the way to fix this is go in and do a manual registry edit, and you're nervous because going into the registry uh, manually can be scary. And you're like, look, before I save a bunch of stuff, I want to save this one piece of the registry. So if I pooch it, I can put it back. And uh, that's, that's actually fairly easy to do. So you click on the part that you're about to edit. You got online and you saw some forum that said, oh, there's a really cool way to change your icons. And you go into this particular spot and you change this to that value and that to this value. And uh, so you want to do this. But before you do that, you pick you know whatever folder you're working in in the registry and then you uh, export it and it just puts a little file you know put it on your desktop put it wherever you want and then if you screwed up reboot and just right click on that same file and import will be an option and it'll put it right back in so you, it's a good way to go back to what you are but uh, the idea of registry backup that would be the only reason I would ever do that anymore Brendan S what type of work environment would you find Linux plus to be very beneficial CERT. Is Linux popular in certain areas of the IT field? The only place that Linux isn't wildly popular is in the desktops of users' machines. Everywhere else on Earth, Linux is predominant. The vast majority of servers, when you go into a web server that you're accessing, is gonna be Linux. Uh, Linux uh, handles, gosh, everything. This, this little phone here, it's really, and they call it Android, it's Linux. Uh, Linux is all powerful and used everywhere. Even things like Mac OS, where, where they're not Linux, but they're based on Unix, and you can go to a terminal in a Mac machine and be a lot comfortable if you know Linux than if you knew Windows. So the question is, is once you get, the problem we run into, Brandon, is we always think about you know, what we're doing at home, and we're working on these laptops, and therefore that's where the jobs are. No, sir. The real jobs are when you get out there, and uh, the, the first time you get working in a data center, and you know, things like that. That's where, that's where Linux lives. And uh, you know, once you get out of the Soho world, you'll find that Linux is predominant in everything. And most DNS servers are Linux. Uh, most DHCP servers, Eh, I better be careful with that one, uh, but um, it's 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 everywhere. So the answer is everywhere, but in the home. John Bear, Professor Messer's A plus study group is great. I've heard great stuff. I've I've listened in. I like Professor quite a, Professor Messer quite a bit. Great guy. Plenty of room in this business for competition. Yeah, David Burns says that, uh, oh, hang on. Yeah, you guys heard me say I'm about to wrap up, so you start asking questions. Smart. Um, na, 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 where, where to go? Mac filtering will just slow people with malicious intent. Yes, it is very easy to spoof a Mac address. Trivially easy. Dr. Quinn, is it safe to assume that you could set it 
Tor it only lets one Mac in? Absolutely, you sure can. Network Chuck, you got me started with your A-plus back in 2009. Thank you for the jump start. Network Chuck, I know you. I'm going to have to check you out. I've seen some of your stuff. Oh, good God, I know exactly who you are, Network Chuck. Your icon was the clue. You're the dude with the big old beard. Stand by, guys. I'm going to pull him up. Let me make sure I'm talking about the same guy. Oh, hell yeah. I know who you are. Great beard network, Chuck. Hey, thanks for jumping on board, too. All right, so guys, uh, just one more time. Remember, the whole goal of this AMA is to help those of you who are out there isolated with coronavirus. This is just an opportunity for us to ask questions and concentrate on the CompTIA IT fundamentals, A+, Net+, and Security+. We can go beyond that if you'd like. We can also talk tech if you want to. Uh, it's all live, so, you know, and I'm working out of my living room here, so it's not like I have a ton of equipment around. But the bottom line is, is I'm always glad here to uh, answer any questions. Also keep in mind, just because you're nice enough to be here today, we're giving 50% off of the uh, total seminars, A+, plus, Net+, plus, and Security+, plus, practice questions. And all you have to do is go to totalsem.com and type in, I think it's MMLive51. Scott Jernigan will type it in there for me. And... Uh, you, it's, a, it's an amazing deal. You know, a lot of people I know who are like fairly good at technology, they want to take a CompTIA exam, like, Mike, do I really need to study? And the answer for a lot of people, if you're a competent tech, is no. Wait, Mike, don't you want to sell me a book and some videos? Well, I do, but you know. Uh, but what you do need is if you're a good tech, most of the time just grab a bunch of practice questions and run through them. You probably know this stuff. I mean, CompTIA A plus is, is you know, the basics of understanding a PC system that connects to a network. Network Plus is the basics of a small network that connects to the internet. And Security Plus is a potpourri of so much that is security. Uh, but um, yeah, so a lot of people just practice questions all you need. So thanks again, Network Chucks. Fun to see you here. Guard Burgess, I only use MAC addresses filtering for reservations and DHCP. I have no, so, yeah. I'm a big fan of uh, static IPs myself. I'm not even going to try to get in the middle of that CTF conversation between TS and Michael Smyre. Yeah, every yeah, it, it's once you get out once you get out away from the user systems, it's going to be you're going to be about Linux. Thanks, John Bear. I like my books, too. So do you guys know, like, in all my books and videos, it's just, like, full of Easter eggs. But they're not easy. I don't make any easy Easter eggs. But, like, my cell phone number is in there. And, like, a lot of my character names for online gaming are in there. I mean, more than Senior Pepe. And it's been more than one time I've been playing a game and somebody spins up a level one character and they're like, hey, are you Mike Myers? It's fun. Take your time. Uh, but uh, John Baird, do you think information tech jobs will increase because of the virus? Uh, there is such a demand for IT right now that I can't, will it get bigger? I mean, it's always getting bigger. The, the biggest problem that most IT people run into is they're not flexible and they don't see as how markets change and shift that what they should do. Like if, I've seen guys I use the word term guys not in, as a gender, okay? I'm from St. Louis. It's, hey, you guys. So gals are in there too. But uh, it, it's a matter of being flexible. Like, for example, um, doing network support, then Zoom pops up out of nowhere, right? Uh, so learn Zoom, you know? It, it, take your time, figure it out. It's like, well, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here replacing RAM. Who cares? Stay on top of the technology, play with stuff, experiment grow. Next thing you know, somebody's like having great demand, somebody who knows Zoom. I'm actually thinking about going from OBS to Zoom even for these talks. So, um, you know, I, I was a little behind. Thank God Michael Smyre had, and Dave Rush were able to help me, you know, getting up to speed on that kind of stuff. So, uh, it's important. Uh, you want the, uh, 
good old, uh, 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 there you go. Put it right back up for you. I didn't see you ask, but I'm gonna put it back up. There you go. There's your mesh topology formula. Is that Allison? Yep, there you go, Allison. Uh, number two, this is John Baer. Is there a special setting in Cisco routers to allow it to be hooked up to a dedicated Netgear VPN router? Special settings to allow it to be hooked up. Are, you mean you want to connect similar VLANs? Yeah, they'll do that automatically. Uh, I got to be careful here. So I haven't really been messing with VLANs for the last few years, but if you're talking about the old, what is it, 802.1Q VLANs? I, I know Netgear is, is totally compatible with that, so you set a switch to VLAN, one, to VLAN 13 and set a Cisco router to VLAN 13 and trunk it properly. Uh, dynamic desirable on the uh, Cisco side. I wouldn't remember what it is on the uh, Netgear side. They'll talk. So, but is it a special setting? No, no, it's just one of the, and I'm, and I'm just assuming, John, you're talking about VLANs. I, I'm, I'm not sure, there, there could be other things you might be pointing at. C Plasman 2009, it's probably mundane, but you can't on, touch on troubleshooting uh, printers. Most of this I can do, uh, most of this I can do uh, for, at least in terms of questions that you'll be seeing on CompTIA A+. Uh, most of the questions are pretty good horse sense that really depend on you making sure that you know how the devices work. It's one of the things, I'm pretty proud about the way I do printers on my stuff, mainly because the questions you're going to hit are real practical questions. Uh, dot matrix, everybody's, oh, dot matrix is dead. No, they aren't. It's it, a, the cheapest dot matrix today is more expensive than most of the laser printers that are out there today. Dot matrix with its multi-form capability is wildly popular. But you have to start, you'll look at questions. It'll get, John has a uh, dot matrix printer and it's pretty dark on one side and as you go it gets lighter on the other. Is that a bad ribbon? No, it's probably a platen adjustment. And if, if you, you know, you gotta make sure you know how all this stuff works, right? And then you can understand the, the questions. And that's the type of question Comte asks. Um, John is printing out, uh, he's got a laser printer and everything is coming out really smeary and it smudges a lot. What is that? Well, it probably the, uh, the heater for the, the presses that uh, uh, sears the uh, toner to the paper is messed up. Uh, what if it's coming out completely white? Maybe the transfer corona is busted. So the secret is, is you know, remember the what is the six-step laser printing process, and uh, make sure you understand how uh, laser printers, inkjets, uh, thermal printers, and dot matrix printers work. Just make sure you know how they work, and then the answers are really, really simple. But you got to take some time and practice learning how they work. Uh, but, but Sam, I am degree versus certification. Degree is always better. Your first goal in life should always be a four-year degree. But not everybody can do that. Um, I don't have a four-year degree. How's that for a shocker? I was just, I was just having too much fun in IT. I was like, I'm doing great. So I never got it. I never got a degree. But you should. Um, can't get a degree. An associate's degree can often be a very positive thing. Uh, but lots of guys still come through from a high school level and are quite successful in the world of IT, but usually you spend up just as many years through OJT on the job training as you would by going to school. So if you can, go to school. You're under a tornado watch? Uh, we live on them up here. Oh goodness, here came a bunch more. Well, T.S. and Michael Smyre, I hope you guys figured it out. All right, so Allison, I think you're okay. If you're not okay, give me a holler back. 
and oh my goodness, guys, here I am complaining there's no questions, and suddenly it's three o'clock. All right, so listen, first of all, have a fabulous weekend. Congratulations to you guys who managed to pass some good certifications there. I forgot who it was. I feel so bad, I forgot. Um, but congratulations. Uh, number two, please remember that we're gonna go to a Monday, Wednesday, Friday formula. But we won't go for just an hour going forward. We're gonna start on a Monday, uh, we'll start on Monday, we'll start at two o'clock Central Daylight Time, and we will be there for as long as necessary, up to about two hours is my quick guess. Having questions ready is a good thing. I'm assuming that you guys are actively studying right now and that you're running into questions, and that's why you're here. Now, if you're just here to hang out, eh, hey, come on, pop a beer, have fun. Um, but uh, make sure that uh, you understand that that's what the goal is here. We're, we're, I'm here to help people who are isolated because of the uh, uh, COVID virus. And uh, Network Chuck, I'm gonna talk to you, man. Uh, Hey, make network check. Make sure you get my email address. Send me an email, brother. I want to. I want to invade your, your channel, dude. And uh, for those of you who I didn't get uh, to your answers, uh, sorry about that. Uh, it's not a problem. Starting Monday, all you have to do is re-ask the question. I will be here. I'm not going anywhere for a long time. I guarantee you I'll be doing this for at least another month. So if I miss you one day, don't get mad. Just come back on Monday and ask your question again, and I'll be here for you. So until then. I'm gonna let you guys go. Also get ready, we're playing with Zoom and we're gonna start setting some stuff up. So we got some amazing teachers that I'm gonna get online here uh, very soon. And uh, so you're gonna to have to have questions ready for more than just one person. But I am counting on you because I can always make questions appear, but that's why I'm here is to help you guys, right? So let me know what we can do for you. Network Chuck, please, please, please send me an email. Uh, is it, did anybody put that up for you? Yeah, there it is. And uh, let's talk, let's have some fun together. I love your stuff. And uh, the last thing uh, I wanna say is I'm out the door here. I'm gonna be working through the weekend because you know Security Plus is fun. And I will see you guys Monday at two o'clock Central Daylight Time. So until then, this is your Uncle Mike saying good night. Good night.